Let's go to Jonah 2. Jonah chapter 2, please. And Jonah 2 and verse 2, after Jonah gets swallowed by this big fish, it says that uh, Jonah's praying there in verse 1, And Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Verse 9. So you continue and you see this prayer, and it ends with verse 9. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. So he's saying, I'm actually going to do what you told me, Lord. That's what he should have done in the first place. Salvation, notice, is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah on the dry land. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening, Lord, and we thank you for this chance for us to come together here at Bible Baptist Church to learn more about you and your word. And Father, just as you fill the Spirit of God as you illuminate us on whether or not salvation is really like fire insurance. And Father, we give you thanks and praise for all things, especially for the salvation that was given by your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. And the reason why I read this section here to start off, brethren, is because we often hear from people who don't know God, when we give them the gospel, they end up saying things like, oh, you just got fire insurance. That's what that's all about. You're just trying to make sure you don't end up in hell. And it's oftentimes used as a way to mock the gospel and to joke about it. And sometimes even preachers, myself included, have stated that, at the pulpit, reflecting upon carnal Christians who tend to live a life as if that's the case. Okay. Now, what's funny about that is these verses show that that was at least true for Jonah. So maybe there's a little more truth there than we think, right? I mean, he literally was in hell and got pulled out. Salvation is of the Lord. So at least one person, I guess, that could apply to, but is that the case for everyone else? Okay. And you might say, well, why are you bringing up insurance, right? But the Bible says by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. In fact, insurance seems to be a huge thing in scriptures. Okay? It's called, or what it means, the word insurance means the transfer of risk. And it's generally a good thing. Okay, We give Jesus our sins. He gives us his righteousness as a result. There's a transfer there. We're trusting him to get us to heaven. He was made that surety. And here we see Jonah praying to the Lord and asking him to pull him out of hell. It actually happened. Okay. Now, I wouldn't suggest that for you. But I'd say you're better off being like everybody else and say before that so you never actually end up in hell. At best, you spiritually go there when you get born again as part of that process of the new birth. Won't go into that this evening. Okay. The baptism into Christ's death is involved with that. Okay. But it made me reflect. So it's like, wait a minute, I guess there is a tiny sliver of truth there, but most people say it in a way where it doesn't apply. And so I was like, well, is salvation really like fire insurance? And no. And that made me think about the rest of them. Okay. The reality is, Jesus Christ has said that he is the first and the last. He's the one that liveth and was dead, and he's alive forevermore. And he has the keys of hell and death. And so I've heard many a preacher say clearly that if they actually their souls actually went to hell, they trusted Jesus so much that they know he'd get the keys, open up the door, and yank them right back out. Amen. I like that preacher. Praise God. Of course, that never happened. They know that. But it's good preaching. And the fact is, I mean, talk about some fire insurance there. I guess you're doing all right. Okay. And fire insurance is pretty important. How many people have fire insurance today? You sniff on the other house. Oh, that, there it is. Preacher said it. If you're a homeowner, in this case, if a corporation owns a building, pretty sure if you have property insurance of any type, property and casualty of any type, included in there is fire insurance, also water insurance and the like. The fact is we insure our property, the things that have material value, for a reason. Okay. But what's funny about that is we do that without a blink of an eye, and the reality is it's only used 5% of the time. How, how likely are you 
to actually have to deal with a fight. I mean, this guy's, well, why you got it then? 5% chance, okay? Maybe I should do my scratch-offs preacher. Maybe I should go ahead and do my take fives at that point. I mean, come on, okay? And yet, we all know the importance of this insurance. We want to protect our asset or whatever that is, okay? And so we get it even though the chance of using it is very slim. And nobody has a problem with that. They seem to think it's common sense. I wouldn't want to sleep in a home of the value of mine without it being insured. What, are you crazy? Okay, if something happens, we're in trouble. Get into car insurance, very similar situation. You know, on average, one claim is done every 18 years. That ain't that much. But on average, that means you'll have three claims in your life. Think about that. So it's enough to want it, and yet not many people have car insurance. Maybe 50, 60% do. That's why it's always annoying to run into that person who decides to hit you, and they don't, they don't have any insurance, right? And you don't have uninsured motors, and now you're in trouble. You had your liability, you didn't do it the other direction, and boom, you got you end up getting an accident with somebody who cannot pay you back. That's rough. Because you didn't have enough fire insurance in that situation. But I bring this up, okay, because we decided to protect these assets that are just material things that aren't that valuable and we're willing to put our money into protecting that, transferring that risk to somebody else, despite the fact that with these numbers, the odds of you using it are very slim. What are we doing? Okay. I mean, think about, well, salvation isn't like fire insurance. That's clear. It has more value than 5% use. Don't you think? On these three. Oh, getting ahead of me, brother. Getting ahead of me. <coughs> Best things in life actually are free. How about your life, period? Before you got the everlasting one. I, I, I didn't go to God and say, hey God, can I be conceived now? Oh, oh, I guess in some religions that's what goes on, but that's another message, okay? I wanna go into a body so I can sin now. You know, the, the weird, unique doctrines that exist these days. Yeah. But fire insurance isn't like that. Instead, it's kind of like this idea where people honor God with their lips, but their heart is far from him. Okay? It's like the, the spiritual situation of a person who claims to have a faith, but they rarely practice it. I mean, they're worse than the CME clubbers. Okay? But they'll claim they're spiritual and they'll say everything they need to say to get you off their back, stop preaching the gospel to me. Leave me alone. Look, look, my, 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 my mother was a Catholic and my grandmother was a Catholic, so I'm a Catholic. This is the kind of stuff. That's fire insurance thinking there. Something you barely touch, but you have it just enough to say that it's there so you don't get bothered by somebody else trying to push religion on you. Okay. That's what it's like. Yeah. That's cool. Well, maybe salvation is like health insurance. Maybe. Well, go to Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2, verse 15. That's, you can see where my mind goes. I'm like, well, maybe... maybe Maybe something. I mean, these things parallel. There's nothing new under the sun. Stuff that spiritual trickles down into other parts of reality. And it's there for a reason. To help you see how God really does things. And see how he can apply to your life. So, is salvation really like health insurance? Well, in Hebrews 2 verse 15, talking about Jesus Christ, it says, And deliver them, this is after Jesus took part of the same, he became flesh and blood like us. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime is on all mankind subject to bondage. And the reality is man has a fear of death. If you didn't, then when you got cut, you wouldn't be trying to get yourself healed. If something happened to you, you wouldn't go to the hospital. You wouldn't be worried about bleeding out. You'd just be like, whatever. Okay? We naturally have a worry of dying. We want to avoid that. Okay? And health insurance is supposed to help with that. Now what's interesting is that over time, health insurance has actually evolved to be worse. Okay? It's become more preventative in the effort to deter large payouts for accidents. Okay? It lacks flexibility in some cases where if you're outside of the place you live, you won't be covered depending on what you got. Okay? And that could be rough if you're international. Ask me or a you got to make sure... <laughs> You're covered when you're out of this nation. 
kayu kan sila these days health insurance despite it being able to help in a preventative way something that you can do regularly what you discover is that when the big surgeries happen the big problems happen all of a sudden they can't help you pay for the whole bill right when you needed them oh you know I I need it I need it I gotta I need to do a, what is it uh, bypass open bypass oh yeah we can cover like you know a piece of that good luck with the rest hope you can come up with 30 grand have fun. You're like, what am I going to, I don't have a choice. I thought this was supposed to indemnify me. It was supposed to make me whole. It was supposed to be surety for me to get through a situation like this so I could live. Isn't it health insurance? That doesn't sound like salvation, does it? Does that sound like how salvation works? Is it just piecemeal? Doesn't really help you in the times of trouble? Is it? I don't know. Many people who are in religions, that seems to be what they think salvation is, huh? That's how they look at it. Okay. And despite these realities, everybody desires to have it because we all fear death at some level and we see a need for it these days. If a place didn't have health insurance, you'd be worried. You'd be looking for it. How do I get that? What do I got to pay? Even though it's not going to give me everything I need. Okay. And so, no, salvation isn't like health insurance either. The health insurance is like something. Yeah. I remember there was a time when our Savior was talking to a woman near the well. And he told this woman right in her face, you worship, you know not what. She was talking about all her great religious system and her situation. Oh, we're looking for this guy to come and all this. So like, you don't even know what you're talking about. But you have comfort in that and you rest in that so you can uh, be with the guy who isn't your husband right now. And health insurance is like that. It's something that people practice regularly. It's like their religious system, what they're caught up in, in their little routine worldview. But they don't really understand the ins and outs of what they believe, and so you ask them, they don't have a clue. And then when the time comes, when the trials come, and situations arise, and they try to run to their priest or their guru or whatever you want to call the guy, their new Buddha or enlightened one, great help they are. Oh, we can't really help you the whole way. You're going to have to do some of it. You're going to have to do something. But I can't do anything. I'm at, the, I'm at dire straits. That's just how it works. 80-20. You guys know the rule, right? So, I guess salvation isn't like health insurance. Where a lot of religious systems are. And it's good enough until things aren't good enough. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh. And I was like, well... Is salvation really like disability insurance? Maybe. All right, go, go to 2 Samuel 9. Let's look at somebody who was disabled and got taken care of in Scripture. That happened. I praise God for it. 2 Samuel 9, verse 13. Here we got a story about a guy named Mephibosheth who was lame. And David heard about him and wanted to take care of him in honor of the promise he made to Jonathan. And it says here in verse 13, So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. And he has no way to produce, no way to add value to the world in that sense. He can't get an income. And yet, because he had a surety from the king, from the promise he owed the king made to, I believe, his father, I believe it is. Uh, I could be corrected there. I have to check. Jonathan, Jonathan was his father. Yeah, okay. For that reason... He was taken care of, and he was able to receive something. And that's how disability insurance is supposed to work. When you can't work for a temporary period, or maybe you can't work permanently, like in this case, it'll give you income so you continue to sustain yourself. Okay. But it never really recovers all your lost income. Now, you ever wonder how, how useful that is? Okay. One out of eight people use disability in the long term for five years or more one out of eight so that's a lot better than with the property and yet you notice how many people don't value disability they're okay with getting only 50 percent of their income covered until it happens and they're not okay where do i get more money this is what happens okay 
But at the very least, people see the value of that. So where they look for that, when they go to an employer, they want to see some long-term provided for free. Everybody wants everything that's free. Okay. And some look for options. Like I pay for short term, better believe it. I'm not dumb. Okay. I'm not waiting 90 days. <laughs> but I digress. Okay. So there's good things with disability here, but it doesn't pay out all the time. It doesn't help out everyone, and it never really gets you to 100% of where you need to go. Does that sound like salvation? Does it help you somewhat? You know, yeah, it'll drag you along, but it'll never actually get you to the finish line? Is that? Brother's looking at me like, no. It helps you to turn but, second base, but you still got to go to third base and home plate. That's right. Here, here's what gets me. Everybody, actually, <laughs> yeah. everybody who's really devout and gung-ho about their religion, they tend to, do all this stuff and really work hard and then they can't finish. And they don't know why they can't do it. Well, what they have isn't able to get them through. It's a home plate. Okay. But I'd say disability is more like that guy who received the seed in Luke 8 verse 13 but it didn't take root. And so he was happy and anon for a while because he got coverage and the moment of trial and then he forgot. That's what disability insurance is like. When the moment comes, they're happy they got something, but nothing really stuck. And so as soon as they're out of disability and they're back in the workforce, they forget about it again. They don't think twice. They don't say, wait a minute, maybe I should pay for more next time. It's pretty clear that I, it was rough for me when I wasn't working. No, that, that's not how people are. <laughs> I mean, we tend to seek God when we're in loss. We tend to seek God when we're suffering. He comes in and does the rescue, but then we forget about him later. So, is salvation like disability insurance? I'm getting a little closer, but no. Not at all. Yeah. You notice that every single one of these sureties talk about things when things go wrong, when things go bad, maybe we'll pick up the pieces for you. Is that how salvation works? Is that what it's about? So I was thinking about that, and I'm like, man, it seems like most insurance wouldn't fit it. Okay, unless you're Jonah, I guess at least fire insurance would. But I sat down for a minute. And I realized, yeah, salvation isn't like any of those, but maybe it's like the one nobody told me about. The one that's different. The one that's set apart. The one that's unique. What am I talking about? Okay. Maybe salvation's like whole life. Ever think about that? So I'm going to give you five reasons why I think whole life is like salvation. Let's be honest, salvation is greater than any of these things. Whole life is close. For example, when you start in a whole life insurance, you're given a unilateral contract. A company comes, a carrier, and says, here, this is what we're going to give you. We're going to tell you all the ins and outs. This is how much it's going to cost you. And all you can do is agree to follow that or not. And it often costs a lot out of you. It requires you to admit a situation, admit that you have a need and you're willing to, to put something down and make it happen. But if you do that, you lock in a benefit that's guaranteed at your death for life. Guaranteed. The only financial product that's guaranteed. Yeah, everybody tell me about that. I like guarantees. I'm saved. Is that what you have? Or, or, or do you doubt your salvation? No, okay, I didn't think so. That's what I love about it. I have no reason to doubt my salvation. It's made surety by Jesus Christ. And now there's a something out there that's guaranteed. But it usually has a high cost. Remember, I can't haggle. I can't try to lower the price down. No, this is what it is. It always has a high price to start. And that's why many people don't want to sign up. Jesus Christ says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. But if you don't think you're laboring or heavy laden, why would you want to get rest? If you think you can handle the burden of sin yourself, why would you go to him? If you don't think it's so heavy. Wait, are you telling me I got to admit that I can't hang and I can't handle this myself? I got to go to somebody else to take care of my problem? Oh, pride. 
You know, you're some preacher talking about Trump having some pride there. Oh, well, there's no doubt about it. We all got a little bit. He's got a lot of it. Okay, I'll be honest. Okay, but to be able to take your pride and throw it in the trash can—that's a high cost for so many people. To admit that you can't handle this kind of risk, the sin, the risk of sin, and everlasting death—you don't want to deal with that. Okay. Likewise, the whole life, the high cost. Yeah. You got to be willing. Well, the company gives you a lot of reasons to trust them. Okay. Just like God gives you a whole bunch. He's only God. Okay. The company's got, at least the good ones, over 200 years of experience. Never dropped the beat. Never not paid one out. Okay. Didn't matter if it was the Great Depression or Nixon changing money or the Cold War or the Korean or the Civil War. They, every, they, they went through all of them. The economy had not, didn't affect them whatsoever. This is why it says guaranteed. I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah. But notice that. The Lord says he will never leave you or forsake you. Whole life is like that. It's always with you. It grows with you. Its use changes as you continue on in life. And you can mold it to help you no matter what moment you're in. Okay. And that's the situation. God the Father gives you a unilateral contract. It's called scripture. What do you got to do? Admit you're a sinner. You can't save yourself. He decides how you're going to come to him. You got to trust in my son. You got to repent of what you are, a sinner, and trust solely in the finished work of my son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to save you from your sins. That's the only way you're going to sign up here. No, I don't need that. Okay, bye. It's up to you. But the only way you're going to get into this contract, if you do it God's way, that's how it works. Okay. But if you choose to sign up his way, you get the guarantee of everlasting life and justification. You get the guaranteed death benefit of glorification. And you get the guarantee of God walking with you every step of the way. 100% guaranteed. No money required, no money back. Like your brother said, it was actually free. Okay. But for some people, that cost right there, brother, is something they can't quantify with numbers. It's too intangible. This idea that I have to admit that I'm wicked. That's, that's hard for a lot of people to do. It took me 24 years to figure it out. I deserve to go to hell for my sinfulness. I can't blame the environment. I can't blame my parents. I can't blame my ex-girlfriends. No, it's, it's my fault. Well, that's, that's hard for people. It's tough, but that, that's what's required. That's the only way you're getting in. Okay. See that? That's the good news. And if you do that, when you're justified by faith, you have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know that when he shall appear, you're going to be like him because you're going to see him as he is in glorification. These are guarantees. This shall happen. What a thing. Okay. And yet, you know, people look at whole life and they think, oh, I don't know. That's too good to be true, man. That whole salvation thing, that's too good. It can't be like that. What do you mean you're, you're, you have eternal security? You mean it's not based on you? Yeah, that's right. And I'm glad. I gave it all to God to handle. If I do that, I'm going to drop the ball. I can guarantee that. Well, I think I could handle it. Well, then you're not going to get saved. That's basically how it works. Okay. Salvation isn't too good to be true. Because the requirements of admitting your sinfulness and your need to trust in some guy who lived 2,000 years ago that apparently died, was buried, and rose again the third day. And you're supposed to believe that from a book? Yeah, you know, I guess that's kind of rough for a lot of people. Okay. And they find that unacceptable. Same thing's true with whole life. And yet when they get it, they get these guarantees. Okay. And that brings you to the second item here. Was well, this special contract you got gives you living benefits, things that help you today. That's why it's called life insurance, not death insurance. And yet that's how it's thought of, right? Now, in the case of whole life, it includes the growth and use of capital that you've put in there, tax-free and market-free. Yeah. Completely separate from what's going on in the world. And yet, it's there. It's in the world, but not of it. Hmm. And you can use it for investments. Yeah. Now, 
Jesus Christ puts it this way in John 17. John 17, verse 23, I'll read that. When you get saved, this is what happens to you. This is what, this is what Jesus asked for. John 17, verse 23. He prays to the Father and he asks that I in them and thou in me that they may be made perfect in one. So Jesus prays that he can be in you so he can perfect you and walk with you. See that? That's called sanctification. That's called growth. You can be a laborer together with God. Okay. Jesus said, come and take the yoke and learn of me for I'm meek and lowly in heart so you can find rest in your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He says, walk with me. I'm in you. I'm investing in you. Are you going to invest in me? Now, that's how salvation works. Once you get in there, you start sanctification. And you make a choice if you want to walk with God mutually. And then God grows you in ways beyond whatever you could ask or think. And shows you so much through His grace you would have never found out on your own. As you were stuck in the world. And the way the whole life works, when you put money in there, it grows and compounds uninterrupted. And you have access to that for the rest of your life. Where am I going to give 50000 to handle that situation, that property damage that happened? Oh, yeah, let's get out of there. Wouldn't that change your life? You mean I don't have to go and like sign forms and figure out whether I have enough good credit in order to get it? And see if some other third party approves whether or not they're going to let me get this money? You mean I won't have loan sharks on my back and avoiding all that stress? Uh-huh, that's what I mean. I mean, you call... Yeah, I want that. Okay, I'll send it to you in two days. No questions asked. You know, when when you pray to God, do you have to like you have to haggle with God and try to fight him to get to get help from God? Is that how it works? Or do you just ask God and He decides? Do you just ask? He's going to bless you. Either way, whether He answers your prayer the way you want to or not, it's going to be the right answer. So that's one thing we got to remember. Okay. And so this happens. God is helping you while you're in the world, even though you're not following the ways of the world. You're not of it. And he helps you grow and grow closer to him and be separate and different from the world as you continue to show that he's superior to everything else out there. Okay? That all his counsel is going to make you better in all facets of your life as you invest the scriptures into yourself and make them manifest in your life for others to see. And you find out the truth about science. And you find out the truth about politics. And you find out the truth about economics. And you find out the truth about finance. And you find out the truth about health. And you find out the truth about spirituality. And you find out the truth of that we need God. You continue to consume as an investment. God. See that? And with whole life, that capital you have there, you can use that to invest and get growth if you want. You want to take out a small amount? Go play in the stock market? Go ahead. You're not losing your... It doesn't, it doesn't subtract from your capital. It's still there. See that? It multiply. You got two uses out of your dollar. Okay, you can try it. You go up there and preach the gospel. You're allocating a resource of the Spirit of God to somebody else, hoping and praying they're going to receive that seed. And oftentimes it doesn't work out. But as you do that, God doesn't depower you. He lifts you up. While it's happening. He's a multiplier. Be fruitful. Right? Multiply. God doesn't say add. That's not how God works. Hmm. Okay. That's how it is a whole life. You can use it and help it get you riches without sorrow like the Bible says. It can be an amplifier for that depending on the way you live. But at the very least, you know that that's there to help you in moments of illness. Your growth and whole life depends on you. It could be really slow. And it could be really fast, depending on how much you want to put into it. Uh, salvation, your sanctification. How much Bible are you reading? How much prayer are you doing? How much church attendance are you doing? How many times do you go out and witness? You go out with the brother? Maybe that will determine how fast you grow. But you're going to grow no matter what. Whether you grow like a turtle or you grow quickly. That's up to you. Okay. And when your whole life is optimized, you're going for the gusto, you're going for the max. You're putting in as much of yourself as you can so God can give you grace that's above whatever you could ask or think. That makes that thing explode. 
That's why I tell people, your Christian life is exponential if you want it to be. Uh, you don't have to wait till you're you know, 20 years old to be spiritual. You can be spiritual from the get-go. Depending on what you decide to do. Live for God or not. And that includes the third thing, the living benefits that are using capital for emergencies and contingencies. We talked about fire insurance. Oh yeah, you can, you can use life insurance to replace that. Moments of disability. Oh yeah, I can draw from it and get passive income. That's what it's there for. For the moments you're not ready for, you have certain money for uncertain times. Huh. When you have emergencies of health and you're trying to find funding, yeah, you can beg a loan shark and get charged 25%, or you can go to your life insurance and pull it out for five and pay it how you want to pay it. Not have to pay it on their terms. No, you can decide not to pay it and get it subtracted from the death benefit when you die. That's up to you. That's how the contract works. Yeah. The point is it's there. What if you get told that you're terminal? Oh, you got cancer, you're terminal. We can't help you. Imagine having the capacity to get out millions of dollars to go somewhere else and get alternative medicine to help you. Imagine that. Oh, you can do that with life insurance, by the way. So what you do? You tell them, look, you were diagnosed to, have, to be chronic or whatever. You got long-term care. You're missing two of the six things. Okay. We'll give you 75% of your death, death benefit right now. Make sure you're taken care of. What kind of other insurance does that? Oh, there's a high cost. You know, a lot of benefits there. Yeah. And the truth is, when you're in salvation with God, there's those moments that are uncertain, those storms of life that come no matter what trial moment, and God will give you the grace to be able to deal with those trials if you go to Him. No doubt about it. He's willing to give it, and He gives it to the uttermost in the storms of life. Go to Matthew 14. I'll show you an example. Matthew 14. That's interesting. Yeah, it's there for the moments of emergency, but isn't it nice that it's there for the moments of normalcy? Normalcy? When there's no problems, it still benefits you, it still helps you, makes you better? Yeah, that sounds a little bit more like salvation. Matthew 14, verse 30. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. This is uh, Peter. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me! Help me! And immediately... That, that, yeah, that's the Lord, right? Immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. Okay, and took him out. That's how it is. Okay. Oh, you have this situation that's dire? You tell the insurance company, get you your money immediately. As quick as they possibly can, I should say. Okay. But with God, it's immediately. God wants to give you grace in those moments of trial to help you deal with the storms of life. One way he might do it is through whole life insurance. It's there for everyone. It's a blessing he came up with. Nobody tells you about it. Fourth thing is that this whole contract here of whole life ends with a guaranteed payout for you and your family. Well, man, that sounds like term. Why can't you use term? Okay. Well, term only pays out 1% of the time. Uh, that sound like a great idea then? No, that right. Rarely pays out. Why do you think it's so cheap? Insurance companies know it ain't gonna actually help you out. You know how many times whole life pays out? Hundred percent of the time. Is that how salvation is? It only works one percent of the time, or does it always work? Hmm. Yeah. Term is more like death insurance. That's what that is. Whole life is really for your whole life. But nobody talks about living benefits. I'm amazed that CPAs don't know about this thing when it's tax-free. Hmm. Maybe the enemy doesn't want you to know about it. Manny, why would the enemy care about the economy? Are you kidding me? <laughs> it's one of the greatest ways he controls everybody. What are you talking about? God. The government regulates the economy for a reason. You know he's part of that. Oh, you think the devil's stupid? Yeah. He ain't dumb. It's just his wisdom's corrupt. Doesn't mean he's dumb. Okay. And you see that. 
It's funny because whole life can guarantee that your family will have generational wealth, will have an estate where one didn't exist. All of a sudden, you're able to make sure that generations after you would have more than the last one. All because you simply realized that you needed to make sure that you accounted for all the value you gave to the economic world when you were alive. That's all it is. That's all, that's all it is. That's how they come up with those numbers. Let me make sure my family gets that in case I, in case I disappear. Okay. And what's funny about this guaranteed payout, so to speak, is it affects things in a greater way. Just like how salvation, as you grow in greater knowledge and your testimony, among others, is believed, they start to see that really God is working with you. It brings out dividends and payouts in ways you wouldn't ask or think. People start noticing that you're different. People realize that the general, generational curses in your family don't stick anymore. Oh, well, your dad was a drinker and your grandpa was a drinker. Yeah, I'm not. Not anymore. God took me out of that. For your family from that mess okay for example that's a big problem in america these generational curses certain drugs and the like that can free you from that change the future trajectory of everybody after you impacting the next generation and beyond if you consider god's word which clearly says a good man leaves an inheritance for your children's children okay not just your children kind of impact are you leaving? Okay. And whole life is just an economic component of that. But salvation should have that kind of impact. Even Manasseh, as wicked as he was, was able to impact his child's child named Josiah. Yeah. And so lastly, despite everything I just told you this evening, whole life still is completely misunderstood and has negative connotations and is avoided in the world. It's because the God of this world is buying the minds of those around you. Okay. Especially doesn't want you to find Jesus and get saved. But he doesn't want you to have a good life either. He wants you to, to find out how to actually be relaxed in your finances. That's, that's the greatest way to keep you locked up in bondage. When you're trying to figure out how to get food on the table. Let's be honest. Isn't it? That's hard, man. Okay. The media and all that stuff we hear out there indoctrinates us to reject life insurance. You hear the agent comes, oh my goodness, that guy's gonna rob you. <laughs> Meanwhile, everybody else is actually robbing you, especially the government. You ready to tax us? Oh, sorry. Okay. They teach you to reject the concept of accumulating capital, of actually saving in a way where your saving stays around even when you use it. Not just saving so you can blow it, and then you're back to zero, and then you gotta save again, and you blow it, and you go back to zero. We're in a capitalistic society, we're not taught to capitalize. That's weird. Sounds like the devil would do that, wouldn't it? Okay. We're taught to reject having guarantees, we're taught to question those and doubt guarantees in life. And yet we're taught to go gung-ho in the speculation about the future. Gung-ho and risking it all so we can lose all our money. And you know that's especially true with salvation. Oh, I don't want to get saved. I don't need that. So I'm going to go into something that doesn't guarantee me anything about my future. I don't know what's going to happen in my afterlife. But at least with this one, I don't have to admit I'm wicked. That's why. And there it is. I don't have to admit I have a need from somebody else I need to depend on to transfer that risk. To transfer that problem, in this case sin, to God. That's all God asked for. People want to give God everything but their sins, like I say in the street. Everything else. Oh, I'll give you my my you know my gifts to Haiti, all the all the poor kids in Haiti, you know, all the all the offerings, I'll, I'll give those. But no, this idea that I'm a sinner, I'm not giving that to you. No wonder why you stay lost. See? God didn't say you can give what you want. He told you what, what's required. You're gonna do it. Okay. And the devil, he's especially focused on that with salvation. But you better believe these key facets of your life, like finance, he wants to make sure you're still locked in his system. So you can never have time to find God because you're too busy working and you're too busy dealing with all the stress and problems. Okay. 
So I'm not going to tell you about something that's actually going to help you when you're living. Why, why would I do that? Says the enemy. Why would I help you? Okay. But let me give you some short-term wealth. Hey, hey, you do this, there's high risk, but high reward. So that doesn't even make sense. Think about that. Why are people preaching that? Okay. If there's high risk, the chance of you losing is high. <laughs> Odds are you're not going to get rewarded. Odds are you're going to lose. So why would you do that? Okay. Hmm. So to conclude, Jesus said that you would, he came that you might have life and that they, and that in this case you, might have it more abundantly. And what you notice is when you get saved, he gives you life at that moment of justification, but he gives you life more abundantly. As that continues to exponentially and grow as he walks with you every day for the rest of eternity. That's salvation. And you know what? Whole life is a general revelation thing that manifests out in finance. That's all it is. So yeah. Whole life is kind of like salvation in that respect. Yeah. It accompanies you your whole temporal life. It'll help you to accumulate a good savings plan when you start up when you're young. It'll help your money grow as you're trying to get to retirement. It'll help you distribute money out. It becomes your retirement plan. It does all that. Not even get into the part where it helps you when you need long-term care. Or when something happens to you. Okay. Likewise, Jesus promises salvation. That's way more than just life after death. It's not just fire and chance. Okay. Through his gift of love and life at Calvary's cross, he promises a relationship with you. To walk with you every step of the way that begins a new birth and never ends. That promises pleasures forevermore. That guarantees you'll be way better than when you started. So if you think this is a whole life insurance commercial, let me let you know. No. Are you saved? That's what's more important. <laughs> are you born again? Yeah. But it is interesting that there are corollaries, even in the world of finance, on these things. Yeah. Because that's what Jesus offers. He sees the value of you as a person and what you can do as a person. Your capacity to live and create and love, and he wants to consume that. <laughs> that's salvation. Do you, how you say it. Pastor, you close us in prayer. <clears throat> Lord,